and some others at uh, Muscat for making the evening possible. Uh, for those of you who have followed the series of talks that this talk is embedded within, which is a program we did this year called Contemporary Talks, it brought together what I think of as, and not just me thinking of um, them in this way, but I think their fields think of them in this way, as practitioners in architecture, in criticism, in art making, in curating. But these are people who are really pushing their field further redefining ways we think about the activities of these um, practitioners. And so what, what I find very satisfying and what our center finds certainly um, uh, the real juice of our mission is to be able to bring people to Atlanta who might not ever come uh, without our initiative and have those people really share their thoughts and ideas, tell you about projects they're working on and so in this regard, uh, embedding the project here at SCAD, our John Yao talk last week uh, took place at Emory. And so we've tried to partner with like-minded institutions to present these um, amazing people. <clears throat> Ellen Molesworth is certainly one of those amazing people. Um, short of me just kind of going gushing and telling you about that for curators, it's a very funny thing. We know more about each other's work not by actually seeing it often. Like, you follow certain people, you know the projects they're working on, you rarely get a chance to see them unless you're in a, you know, a major center like New York or LA. And so if you're in the Baltimore Museum where Helen worked, or you're at the Wexner in Ohio, or at uh, Harvard in Boston, and now at the RCA in Boston, um, I'm just not in Boston that much, and can't be, and unfortunately I have missed numerous shows over the years that I think of as being legendary, and yet I've never seen them, and for the most part I know them through publications, and reviews, and the respect of people in the field, all of which Helen has. Um, so by way of just telling you, I think that she's made a point of working with some of the most challenging artists uh, over the last half century of practice, um, those are people including Bob Toymans, uh, Paul Chan, William Bobel, Felix Gonzalez Torres. She's worked on needy issues in terms of the definition of roles of the artist, how artists practice their work, uh, the notion of objects and what objects are and can be. Um, and so these are projects that she'll talk about tonight, so I'm not going to tell you too much about them except to say that they really have been very significant in the form of exhibition makings and scholarship and thinking. And so uh, on top of that, one can also say that Helen has been a critic at Yale, has been at the Bard Center for Territorial Studies, at SUNY Old Westbury at the Cooper Union. Um, she's written extensively for Art Journal, for Art Forum, for Documents, and for October. She did her PhD in the History of Art at Cornell. As I said, she's currently at the ICA in Boston, and this year, very recently, is the recipient of the 2011 Award for Curatorial Excellence given by the Curatorial Studies Department at Bard. It's very, very happy making to have her in Atlanta. Without further ado, Helen Walsworth. about this talk. 
I've given this, this is my third time giving this talk. Um, and the first time I gave it, I was so nervous I thought I was going to vomit for the whole time. <laughs> the second time I gave it, I cried. So this is the third time to charm. I'm going to try and maintain all of my bodily functions while <laughs> with you this evening. Um, when I first uh, started speaking publicly, being, being lucky enough and privileged enough to be asked to speak publicly, um, I routinely spoke about other people's work. So I would give a talk about an artist that I was working on, or an artist who's, I was doing a project with, or an artist whose work I was trying to acquire for a permanent collection, or um, an essay that I was working on for a magazine. And about, I think, two years ago, I started getting these invitations to talk about my work. And I was very confused by those invitations and didn't really know what do with them, and so I would show up and talk about someone else's work, um, which made me, I, felt, I just felt much more comfortable. Um, but finally someone asked me to give one of these talks about quote-unquote my work, and they asked me to do it in, in um, Europe, and um, I smoke cigarettes in Europe, <coughs> uh, and I don't smoke them here, and so I thought, well, I could extend that kind of foreign soil rule and I could try to experiment with what it would mean to be able to talk about my work um, in context where basically, I mean, it was a chicken shit move, like I didn't know anyone, and so if I failed or if it didn't work out, like it didn't, it didn't matter to me. I mean, it did, but it felt like a, safe, a safer place to try and experiment with what talking about my own work might mean. Um, but I found that it forced me, and subsequently the second time, and also this time, that one of the things that it um, asks me to, to do that I find very useful is to really become much more self-reflexive about the work that I do. Um, and to, to ask myself, why do I do the work that I do? Why do I, why do I make the choices that I make to be, interest, what, to be interested in the things that I am interested in. Um, and I think that in the curatorial field, there's been this kind of split, like either you're a curator who really imagines yourself as an advocate for others, you know, and you get up and you talk about the artist's work and the artist's <coughs> needs and intentions and desires. Or there's this other model of curating now that's much more authorial, in which the curator stands up as if he or she were, in fact, that sort of occupies the place of the artist and speaks about you know, their, their shows as their creation. And I've always been um, nervous about, in a way, both models. Because to only stand up and talk about others is to engage in a fantasy of like selflessness and not actually address one's own ambitions or one's own desires or be present, you know, to, to one's own self-motivation. I'm not, a, as much as I might want to be, I'm not really a selfless person, right? I have an investment in what I'm doing, so how do I talk about that? How do I think about that for myself in a way that's interesting? So I'm a little skeptical of that model, but I'm also skeptical of the model of the curator as an artist. Because, uh, you know, I don't feel like an artist. Um, I often, on most, on most days, feel like um, upper level management, uh, which I am, I'm the chief curator. A whole host of people report to me, and I'm the go-between between the director and my staff. Um, I, I feel like I'm a bureaucrat, you know? A good part of Monday and Tuesday is a routine of meetings and paper signing that would kill the soul of anyone, you know? Um, and my experience of artists is that, the, the, you know, one of the great privileges, I think, of being an artist is, you know, a lot of them get to say no to that kind of thing. It's not that they don't have their own forms of drudgery and management and bureaucracy, but you know, they managed to be a little more inventive about how they process it. 
Uh, and I also don't feel like an artist because I don't think I, I don't think I think like an artist um, in that ineffable way that that artists think, which is not something I really even still after 20 years of thinking about how artists think can talk about in very persuasive or even coherent ways. Um, but um, but I know I don't think like an artist. I know I think like an art historian. You know, I see something made, and I try and immediately think about like, what is it made of, what does it mean, where does it come from, what is its context, and where is it going. You know, those are those are the way. That it's like I'm I'm stuck in grade school. It's still like you know who, what, where, when, and why. Um, and I don't think most artists encounter work in that way. Very different ways of encountering art objects. So then, how do I talk about um, my work? So I realized that of all of the things I have done, most of them I actually don't consider to be my work. Like I, I co-curated Luke Twyman's, you know, American Retrospective, but I, that didn't really feel like my work. That felt like Luke's work. Same with Louise Lawler. Um, I always felt like that that was work done very much in the service of another, um, both the artist and also the public. Uh, and then, if I really think about it, um, there are really only three things I could talk about at this stage is really being like my work. Um, and that all of them in some way focused or, or were related to the work of Marcel Duchamp. Um, and that all of them, all three projects, uh, also were, well, let me back up. There's this great quote by Lee Krasner, who apparently said, so you can sort of pull up a Lee Krasner painting in your mind, you know, one of those great cutout ones beautiful kind of very abstraction. Every one of those pods about to split. And she said, oh, my work is totally autobiographical if you look at it. <laughs> and I have carried that quote around in my head for years. <laughs> like, wow. I really like my Christmas work. <laughs> and I've looked at it a lot. <laughs> But it meant that when she looked at her work, she felt exposed. Is what I think that quote meant. And I realized that in thinking about my work, when I look at the three things, or the two things I'm about to show you, I actually feel really exposed. And in one of them, work ethic, I wasn't aware of that exposure until the show opened. And I was like a kind of penny drop for me. And then in part object, part sculpture, I was much more self-conscious about what I was doing. Um, and so when it opened, I felt like more than exposed. I, I mean, I was just naked in the galleries. Um, so anyway, I'm just going to talk a little bit about, about these things and see if there's a way that they might be um, interesting to you all. OK. Um, one of the things I knew I was interested in when I, um, you know, I, I got my PhD and I, my father's a professor, and I always feel like very lucky that he wasn't a coal miner because I would have just become a coal miner. So I went and I got a PhD and I went and became a professor. And pretty soon into it, I was like, oh, this sucks. I don't want to do this. Um, which made me feel very, very guilty. Uh, because I always thought teaching is the noblest, you know, along with being a doctor, it's the noblest profession. Um, but I realized that I wasn't interested in arguments that happened from this kind of space, for the most part. That I was really interested in the possibility of an argument that could be made in space. Um, so I wanted to make these art historical arguments in space. I wanted to make exhibitions that functioned like 
the great art history essays that I loved when I was in graduate school. Um, but I was always very, I was a little skeptical, even of the greatest art history essays, like something by T.J. Clark or Rosalind Krauss, like the kind of essays that, you know, grab you and like you're, you're off on that amazing intellectual ride. Because I was very aware that when I was writing about a work of art, I could make work of art do whatever I wanted. Like I was very in control. And that one of the things that happened when I would then go and look at those works of art in the museum or in the gallery is that they often wouldn't adhere to my dictate. They, that, that my interpretation might be really smart and might be really clever, but that the object had this other kind of resistant energy to me that I became very interested in. And so I was curious if one could make great art historical arguments with the objects in the room so that they might even have the opportunity to like fight back a little bit of the, of the context that you were putting them in. So the first um, uh, art historical argument that I had made in full was my dissertation, which was on Marcel Duchamp's ready mates. And I wrote an entire dissertation about how Duchamp was a shopper. Like all this stuff had been written about Duchamp, about how he bought the ready mates and then, you know, and it doesn't really produce an object becomes art, or the artist hand is no longer necessary, or like all these like big lofty like boy ideas. And I was like, wow, there's like we need to back up and start where this thing actually starts, which is Duchamp goes out shopping. <laughs> and he goes out shopping in the teens in America at precisely the moment where there's a huge outpouring of books and magazine articles aimed at women trying to teach them how to shop for ready-made goods, right? And so I got really fascinated by this idea of Duchamp as a shopper. And Duchamp as a shopper who wanted to shop without having taste. He wanted to make choices without deploying his taste. Now I get that as a kind of intellectual thought game, but I also tried it a lot when I was writing the dissertation. And I was really aware of like how deeply hard it is to go out and shop without deploying any of your own taste. And then of course what often would happen in the shopping excursions is that I would invariably find something that was me. And then I got really interested in that shopping moment, which I think many of us have. You're in the gap. There's 800 pieces of crap that look exactly the same. And one of them is you. And I, I'm fascinated by that moment where the commodity calls out to you, where you hear the commodity call out to you. And you put it on. And your friend, your friend, and other confirms this says, oh my god, that's so you. <laughs> so it's not just a solo hallucination, it's a shared reality that happens. That's this nexus of desire and, and call and response between oneself and something inanimate. Right? And so I, it became hard for me to think about Duchamp as really being outside. Like he might play around with the possibility of outside of that the way in which our, our identities and our sense of self is not possible outside of the object world, right? Outside of this, um, this game of taste. So that was my dissertation. Um, and so then I got the job at a museum. And I worked at the Baltimore Museum of Art big public museum, and I often gave public tours, and there was a great Donald Judd plywood box sculpture in the contemporary galleries, and I loved the sculpture. And invariably, when I would do tours of the permanent collection, 
really without fail, someone would say to me, how long did it take to make that? And at first I got very angry at this question. I found it to be aggressive toward the artist and aggressive towards the object. And I was curious about the quality of aggression that the museum viewer often has towards contemporary art. Um, but since the question came up so often, I decided that there was, I could, I could be high, holier than thou about it, or I could try and figure out what, what, what does that question mean? How does one answer that question? Since it's so pervasive, like I seem beholden on me. Now I imagine I was working for the public, you know, the city paid my salary. The people have questions. Um, <laughs> And so what I started to hear in that question was not so much aggression, um, but rather like a really profoundly American question about work and labor. Like how long did it take to make that began to ring in my ears as a question about labor. Like, how long did it take to make that? And I realized I would write articles and make shows, and often people would say to me, so how long did it take you to make that show? Like that that's a way of quantifying an activity. And so I came up with the idea of thinking about the show called Work Ethic, in which I became very obsessed with these photographs of these artists. Um, and now, when I was in school, we were taught that these were photographs of artists in their studio making artwork. But I began to see them as photographs of people working, and I became really obsessed with how many photographs there are of people working from this period, and precisely the moment when I think people got pretty anxious about what the quality or quantity of the work was going into the production of these kinds of objects. So you have, you know, Pollock spilling paint and Frank Stella painting a stripe painting out, you know, with the brush right out of the can. And then you have Frank Stella dressed up as a businessman, which is an interesting twist. And Warhol in the factory production. And of course, the great, you know, with this still, I find this image hilarious, the Richard Serra, like the sling in the lead. <laughs> Look at that, man. Like, I see, I, it's like she doesn't protest too much, you know what I mean? Like really, like the work shirt, the belt, the jeans, the, the big heroic gesture, the gas mask, like this dude is working. He's not just throwing lead. He's not fucking around, man. He is working. So I got really interested in thinking about artists that work in the 60s. Which is, of course, precisely the moment that the U.S. economy is shifting from a production economy to a service economy. And it's precisely the moment where a certain kind of artistic labor gets foregrounded. So the show had four sections. You know, um, the first one was the artist as worker. So the artist sets him or herself a task and then completes it. They're both like the worker and the manager. They're a perfect amalgam of the two. Um, so Vito Akanchi gives himself these crazy tasks of stepping up and down in the stool, mailing new beliefs, you know, documents her housework, his artwork, thereby gaining like double, she's double dipping. Um, same with Martha Rossler, or someone like Robert Morris's box with the sound of his own making, in which like the, the artwork itself proves all of the work that went into making it, because you hear the sawing and you hear the banging. But of course, what you also hear in this is the tape is like eight hours long and there are long stretches of silence, which I love. Because you know, you gotta like sit, look, and smoke, and right. Um, and so this these are some installation shots of the show. Uh, you know, now women, Sarah's hand catching lead, people assigning themselves a task and then performing it. So they're both like the worker and the manager. Then, of course, there's a different kind of artist, pure management. Um, you know, like, you do it. I have the idea, you do it. 
And I realized, like, there's a lot of my life that's like that. I have a lot of ideas, and a lot of other people do them. And I get the credit. You know? Because I'm the thinking one. I'm the brain. I'm the, you know? There's this profound division, right, between hand labor and brain labor. Uh, oddly enough, this was the painting gallery in this show, which was my own private joke that no one ever got. <laughs> There's a Warhol painting, a Robert Rauschenberg white painting, um, and a solid white wall painting. And no one ever got that it was, and people would love it. They'd get in there and be like, oh, this is my favorite work. And I loved it because it was exactly the work that they were most skeptical of. It was the work that had all been done by somebody else. Um, then there was a lot of work, a lot of artists, I think, turned the table. So like, hey, fuck this, man. You do it. You, audience. You complete the work. I'll come up with a situation. And then, but in order for us to have an ethical contract with one another, as artists and audience, you have to do, you have to meet me halfway. You have to cut off my clothes, you have to play ping pong, you have to build an ice wall, you have to, you have to, um, like an Irwin Verm platform, you have to stand on that platform with those objects and become a sculpture for your fellow viewers. You have to make the work. And then there was my favorite category in the show, which was the artist tries not to work. <laughs> And there are a couple of different ways of not working. There's striking, there's laziness, and there's you invent a machine to do the work for you. Right, so you have Tom Marioni, that drinking beer with friends is the highest form of art. Like, every Wednesday at 6 o'clock, time to make art. <laughs> um, machines for making art, like the tangy and the rocks of pain. Right, so mechanized drawings, mechanized painting. And Louis Lozano's General Sprite piece, which is like one of the greatest works of art for me of the second half of the century. The work that says, I refuse to participate anymore in the commercial art world. And the systematic accounting of all the things she would not do. And the not doing is the work. So work ethic opened. And I realized that it had opened two years after I got my first big museum job. And that it was very autobiographical. Because it was this huge shift in my own professionalization of myself. I had become a certain kind of worker. I had left the academy. I had left grad school. I had left my kind of hand to mouth downtown New York life, and I had a, you know, a 403B, and a wardrobe of work clothes, and an assistant, and a Rolodex, because those were the days still of the Rolodex, and, and then often, however, I was anxious about whether or not when I was sitting at my desk reading the art forum, was I working? Was that work? I was doing a studio visit with an artist I loved with that work. Felt a lot like pleasure. But I got paid for it. My mother would ask me repeatedly, so tell me again, just, just describe what you do in a day. <laughs> My mother, just describe, she really wanted to know, like, what, what did it look like? What did my work look and feel like? And I realized that I had a lot of anxiety about it. I never knew if I was working enough. Um, I had a hard time reconciling the work I did with the salary I was receiving. I didn't know whether or not um, they made sense together. I was amazed that one's coworkers would tell you all sorts of things that I did not want to know, but they would never tell you what they made. I was really, you know, so I was, I was naive. I was young and I was naive. And I was really um, trying, I think, in a way to figure out what did it mean to, what did it mean that I had decided to do for work what I loved? What did that mean um, to the category of pleasure and pleasure and work in my life? And that work ethic was, in a way, a part of trying to 
unpack some of those issues that were germane to me at that point in my life. Um, so, so then I went on to do many other shows, but I didn't do another sort of art history based group show again until I did part object art sculpture. Um, which also comes out of Duchamp because it, uh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna scroll ahead. Okay. That's the wedge of chastity. The top thing is made out of metal. And it sits in this bottom thing that's made out of a material that the dentist uses to make a mold of your teeth. I have a big dentist phobia. So, relatively late in life, Marcel Duchamp, as a bachelor, married Tini Matisse, who was Henri Matisse's daughter in law. So Tini Matisse married Henri Matisse's son. That's a big, like, you know, that's like a royal wedding. Duchamp marries Matisse. And they marry late, and on their wedding day, Duchamp gave Tini the Wedge of Chastity as a wedding present. And Tini used to take it with them whenever they traveled. And she would put it on the dresser in a hotel room, or on the coffee table when they traveled to people's houses and they were staying or anything. So that it would always be there between them. As Duchamp says in the famous interview with Pierre Cabal, like a wedding ring. It's amazing. This public thing, this acknowledgement, but also a secret. Um, partly a secret because you can imagine going to dinner and Marcel and Tini are guests and you're excited and you don't actually say when you see the way they're on the coffee table say quasa you, you know you think like hmm here's Marcel Duchamp you, know, you might not ask about it you can imagine that it would maybe sit there somewhat secretly somewhat quietly the other secret about it is that if you pick up the metal part the metal part fits absolutely snugly into the pink dental mold part and when you pick up the metal part, the pink part looks like a pussy. And I mean like a lot of pussy. Like, you pick it up and you kind of guess. And I'm not a big gasper. <laughs> I just don't, I, I don't, I don't surprise easily. And pussy, I got one, familiar. But it is shockingly and shatteringly realistic. I became obsessed with this object. <laughs> Why? Well, it was 2004 and I was living in Ohio and my partner, my girlfriend, the time was living in Baltimore. And Gavin Newsom had started to marry gay people at City Hall in San Francisco. So I called my girlfriend on a Thursday afternoon and I said, why don't we both fly to San Francisco tomorrow and get married? And she said, honey, I'm working. Can we talk about this later? <laughs> she is not a romantic. Um, it didn't go anywhere, and um, we didn't. We actually didn't talk about it later. Um, but after the state of Massachusetts 
made it actually officially legal for gay people to get married. She asked me if I wanted to get married to her in Massachusetts. And I said yes, and started to make part of her sculpture. Because I never thought I would be married. I thought marriage was something that straight people did. And so when straight people would say, oh, you know, being married is so much different than not being married, I would think, well, that's because being straight is being different than being gay. <laughs> like, what could it possibly be about this thing called marriage that could be that different than living together? Um, but I started to read a lot about marriage, and I started to read a lot about Tini and Marcel's marriage. This marriage that came late, this marriage that came utterly and completely of choice. There were no children. They were free and old enough to have sex if they wanted to. They were both financially very well off. They did not need to get married. They wanted to get married. And I started to think about, again, this idea of objects and the body. And so I made this show called Part Object Art Sculpture that is a lot about arrows and desire and secrets and openness and things that are not said and things that cannot be said and things that look like one thing but behave like another. Uh, objects that are dynamic and bodily and sensual Objects that hang on the wall like paintings, but behave like sculptures. Objects that engage in forms of repetition that are were very organic and not quite industrial. Uh, objects born of a poverty of means. A lot of objects that were molded. A lot of objects that looked as if they had been extruded from the body. And I began to think about those, every ready-made you've ever seen in a museum is actually made by hand. It's not a ready-made that Marcel Duchamp bought. It's not industrially produced. That's just a convenient art historical fiction. They were all lost, or discarded, or thrown away, or forgotten, or not seen, and hence needed to be remade according to blueprints by Arturo Schwartz and a group of Italian craftsmen in 1964, after Duchamp made this series of these crazy little sexy objects. The Wedge of Chastity, the Objet d'Or, which is the crazy, I'm not really a phallus, but maybe I am, uh, and the female fig leaf, which is actually taken from the female fig from the mold of making the female figure in a tongue And then I began thinking about all of the kinds of objects that were made in the wake of this. Again, like intensely handmade. So Sai Twombly, wrapped and bound in sculptures, Rauschenberg little boxes, John's is very lovingly reproduced handmade, ready-made light bulbs. The relationship between Johns and Rauschenberg and Twombly, they gave a lot of these things as gifts to one another, this kind of economy between artists of gift giving. These amazing early Eva Hessas from 1964. Uh, I, and then I just started playing around. Like we installed the ready mates the way they're installed in the Poitain Police. Um, we installed them in a room with all of these examples of the handmade Jackson and Johnson's. We installed them as they were originally installed in Duchamp's studio, so the hat rack suspended from the ceiling, casting shadows, um, a kind of secret double. And then molds. Mold, like, for all of that talk about minimalism and industrial reproduction and the serial and the sameness, I got really interested in, like, what about all those things that are totally about accretion and like where repetition is totally bodily, you know, where it's totally organic and this other, much more messy form of repetition. 
that to me spoke everywhere of the body, everywhere of um, the body as a kind of polymorphous, perverse, totally alive surface, from your fingertips to the top of your scalp, every bit of your skin, um, on white. Um, and the repetition of forms and bodiliness that kept happening, whether it was in Kusama or Alan McCollum or Marcel Brote or Sir Felix Gonzalez Torres. And so this uh, was part of their part sculpture, and it basically was one great big huge, huge love letter. Because it ends with a room that has only three things in it. A Robert Gober suitcase in which you look down and you see the magical tide pool and the, the man, the man sort of holding the infant. The Gabriel Orozco Mesa de Trabajo, which is a working table where he makes all these sort of hand-molded little objects. And the Josiah Magdalene chandelier in which this is his um, imagination of the Big Bang in chandelier form. And that is the last room. Uh, and so one of the things I was interested in was, um, and I'll, I'll say this one last thing and then I'll, I'll close so we can, we can talk together. Um, the history of the avant-garde in the 20th century primarily has been narrated around the concept of shock, that artists want to shock you. bourgeoisie. And I saw something else in this kind of work. I didn't see shock, I saw um, shattering, dispersal. Not this massive blow to the system that somehow truncates you or amputates you or, or or you know, makes you uncomfortable, but this rather this other version of um, affect that one could have in relationship to an art object, which is shattering, uh, which is a kind of like all over sensation. If you think about when you drop glass, there are two, you like it can either shatter into millions of little pieces or it drops and it stays whole but with all those lines through it. And to me, this felt actually a bit like love about like the experience of falling into, um, into love with another person. Um, but I didn't find that I was shocked by falling in love, but I did find that I was shattered by it. <coughs> that the sense of myself that I once had was no longer, I could no longer hold it as a uniform whole. That the profundity of a relationship with another single person who is utterly and completely different from you that you, that you decide to um, embark in a life with, not because you are the same, but actually because you are different. Like, the fact that we both like Chinese food and, you know, grew up on an island only gets us so far. What gets us somewhere is actually the moments when she says something to me that I could never think and that I actually don't quite understand. Like that is the shattering moment of love in which my own sense of self is wobbled. And it was that wedge of chastity to be put down a secret of that shattering effect that can be had between two people to be carried around like a wedding ring. Um, that was the, the investment to make such a show, was to explore like those kinds of ideas, but in an art show. And um, so that was um, our object of So I think it's a good, I mean, I think this is, I feel, I feel like I should stop. <laughs> <laughs> You've all been very polite, but none of you have said, all right, good job for me. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah.
I wanted to make a show about the thing that can't be shown. I wanted to make a show about a bachelor who got married. Um, I wanted to make a show about arrows. I wanted to make a show about the way we disperse our desire and arrows through objects. Um, I wanted to make a show about the utter and complete paucity of language in the face of love. Well, one of the nice things about the show is a lot of them were dead. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of the artists who were in the show, I don't, I think a lot of the artists in the show saw an art historical argument in which the stranglehold of minimalism as the driving engine for making sculpture was put off the table. So many artists felt liberated in the face of that. But Bob Gober, Robert Gober came to see the show. And he walked through the whole show, and at the end, you know, we went out to lunch. And he was talking about his own work, which artists do, and I said, what did you think of the show? And he looked at me and he said, oh, well, you know, he said, that is a very strange show. <laughs> experience where we want some of you to experience certain things as they're moving through space. Can you talk a little bit about how you move those things together? And I mean, do you start generally, get more specific, or how does it work? Um, it's funny that you use mixtape, um, because I often think about, um, I use a lot of music metaphors when I think about curating, cooking metaphors, and for a long time with both work ethic and part object, I used metaphoric chapters. The way I built um, part object and I built exhibitions subsequently, that the first room had a Guatemala balloon, so it had that suitcase. Then the second room had all these little boxes that Rauschenberg had made as gifts for his friends that had lids that were open. The third room had um, a Marcel Proteus and the Yayo Kasama suitcase piece, and the fourth room had the Gober suitcase piece. So, the, so basically what I'm saying is that there was a kind of physical and visual morphology that ran through the galleries. Every room had something that was suspended from the ceiling as a way to kind of sculpture's constant problem is like, how the fuck do I get rid of this space? You know, like, God please leave the pen. Um, and every room, save the first one, but the last three rooms all had um, light pieces in them, whether it was Johnson's light bulbs or Felix Gonzalez Torres's light pieces or the Magdalene chandelier. So it was this way of thinking about like light motifs, rhythm, um, and forms of repetition that were precisely like the same but different. Right, which is sort of how you're making a mixtape, like thinking about a kind of visual or physical segue from not only object to object on the wall, but also room to room, chapter to chapter. So that even if, and I, I think one of the reasons I did this is one, it feels really good. Like I think viewers, um, you feel an increasing sense of mastery, which I don't mean in a bad way, but I mean like in a like, oh, okay, oh, I got it. Sort of like when you hear a new album, like by the second or third time, you're like, oh, I, I, yeah, I like this. This is happening, you know? Um, but also such that if someone really does want that mythic visual experience, which I actually never have because I'm so wordy and neurotic that there is no, it's like, like the people who just have visual experiences, I would love, I, I, I don't know what that means. But for those people, nonetheless, 
I try to provide what I imagine is a purely visual experience in which you could go through part object, part sculpture, and know nothing about, you know, love or minimalism or Eros and Duchamp, but have that feeling of, of visual rhyming, visual sameness and difference. And hopefully that that in and of itself is a, an aesthetic experience um, that cracks you open a little bit. Um, both of the shows started with specific objects. Work ethic started with that Donald Judd box. And part of their part stop. Sculpture started with the Wedge of Chastity. And they started with my own inability to explain my love for the, those objects. And a desire to figure, like, figure out how do I tell the story about this object so that I understand why I love it and I can share with the public, like, hey, love this, because this is really great, right? Um, then there's a research phase in which, um, you know, with, with work ethic, work ethic had a lot of chapters at one point, like it had, you know, exchange and buying and selling, and I realized, oh, that, I'm getting, it's too big. I need to be very um, clear about the different forms of labor. And so that became like these, a, a sense that labor was at stake. And then I just tried to really map out in a structural way, like what are the different forms of work post-war, right? Um, and what are the different forms of work post-war in art? And what are they in the culture of art? So production, to management, to information, to experience economies. Um, with part object, part sculpture, it was different. That was like, that quickly became a, a list of names of artists. And then that was a really, that was like my first good old fashioned art history, like curatorial research. So I like, I went on a trip to Milan and looked at every Lucio Fontana painting I could see. Like, do you, you know what I mean? And like, I looked at every Manzoni I could get my hands on. And I went to, you know, this tiny little town in Siena, you know, in the, in, outside of Siena to the Alberto Brewery Foundation. Like that, then it was very immersive. Like, there were artists and I went deep and chose what I thought were the objects that were both the best, but also that have these rhyming resonances with one another. And yes, there are always things you don't you don't get. I mean, Oldenburg isn't in this show because I couldn't get the soft toilet. And like once I couldn't get the soft toilet, I was like, well, he's dead to me. <laughs> But I couldn't, there was no, do you know what I mean? I, like, I didn't need a soft ice cream cone, I needed a soft toilet. I was doing a Duchamp show. You know what I mean? So like, so there was that, yes, there are definitely lungs I don't get. I think that the curators, they tend not to answer the question, how is the object made? Like, you, you mentioned earlier, how fast, how long does it take to make the object? But how is the object made? Which also connects to the personality, the psychology, the neurosis of the artist. Can you just comment on that? Does that inform? I know work ethic like, embrace that to a certain extent. I don't know if you just showed stills or how, to the degree, the depth of answering that question that show went. Mm -hmm. But I'm just curious. Um. And I, this was something that only happened to me once I started working in museums. When I was a quote, like quote unquote, great art historian scholar, 
And when someone would start talking about how it worked, this made my eyes roll back in my head. I, I, it didn't make, to me that felt like a private activity that happened in the studio. That was something that the artist needed to worry about and didn't have any bearing on the artwork's public life in the museum. Um, but oddly enough, museum work makes you really concerned with how things are made because it's only through an understanding of how things are made that they can in fact be properly cared for in perpetuity, right? And so museum work for me was actually quite challenging in that way because I had to sort of counterintuitively or against my own vein, my vanity or my own arrogance, I had to become interested in how something was made. Um, which I didn't think as much about in work ethic as I actually oddly did in hard object art sculpture. Where the, where the tactility of objects and the fact, for instance, that those Louise bourgeois are molds, the, the whole category of mold making and the use of the mold to produce um, uh, serial, re serially repetitive objects became really important to me. Particularly because Duchamp has an idea called the um, the, enfram the enframance of the infrafin, in which he has several notes in the green box where he talks about how the mold never produces exactly the same object, that there's an infinitesimal difference in each object that is made from the same mold. And I got really interested in the way in which artists would make things um, with similar procedures, like twisting and tying and wrapping, which happened in Twombly and Hesse and Bontecu, you know, um, mold making, which happens in Brotaire's White Way, McCullum, and Duchamp, right? Like that these kinds of, that these physical activities had, for me, psychic, they had a psychic valence. Like, what does it mean to be an artist who sits in his or her studio making molds or to make a sculpture or twisting little pieces of metal over and over again like in a Montague to make a sculpture? Like, but that twisting, like that incredible tactility, I began to find myself trying to physically imagine what it felt like to make the thing. Which, for me, then moved back into this um, problem of love, which is a, basically the unknowability of the other. That as much as I might understand how an art object is made, that there is still something like very radically othering in that. I think for many curators and art historians who are not hand people, who have in fact no hand, don't have kind of knowledge in their hands, you know. Um, and you can either make, you can either write write that ignorance off, or or I try to now figure out like what what do I do with that otherness? And I don't know if, I don't know if I'm adequately answering your question. It's a hard question for me. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Helen, can you talk a little bit about the show you're working on that deals with the 1980s? Because if, if the previous two shows that you talked about deal with labor and love on some levels, then the 80s is a different zone. Yeah. I'm working on a big show in the 80s. And I know what it's about, and I'm really embarrassed by it. Um, I'm working on a big show in the 1980s. And uh, I started working on it for a couple of reasons. Um, and the, 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 really the, I mean, there are two reasons. One's personal, one's political, which means like they're both personal and political. Um, uh, I realized about six years ago that it had started to be the 20th anniversary of um, the death of people I knew who had died of um, uh, AIDS or AIDS-related causes in the 80s. Uh, 
And you know, whatever, you're only 40 or 45 once. And so these things, you know, one of the weirdest things I personally have found about being an adult is the constant surprise of its newness, like how, how one is sort of frequently ill-prepared for the conditions one finds oneself in. I, I had thought something was going to happen where I would be, you know, that, I mean, maybe, maybe it's just me, but I don't know. So I wasn't prepared for um, the confrontation of the 20th anniversary of death of someone my own age. Um, and so I started to think a lot about the 80s and the 80s that, um, that for me was very, very much shaped by the uh, AIDS crisis. Um, and, then, and then there was the Bush administration. Um, in which I felt, um, you know, there's that great quote from Malcolm X when, Ken, when he hears that Kennedy is assa has been assassinated. And Malcolm apparently said, well, chickens have come home to roost. Which is the thing that got Malcolm in a lot of trouble. Like, how, could, how dare you say that in Camelot? But I think what Malcolm was saying was, you know, well, what do you expect to engender in a society based on the most ruthless, mindless violence? What did you expect? And so um, one of the things that happened for me in the Bush administration was um, a realization that many of the things that were started under the first, under Reagan and first Bush administrations had come to complete and full fruition so that people who were shocked and just didn't know how we had gotten into this amazing financial crisis. Seemed to me had been, you know, engaged in a kind of deep and purposeful amnesia about the deregulation of the financial markets under the Reagan administration and the dismantling of the Keynesian economics and the systematic rollback of the uh, social justice movements of the 60s and 70s. Um, there you have it, yes, I'm a Marxist. <laughs> um, and so I was curious about um, how one might not lose some of the radicality of the work of the 80s and some of the history of the 80s so um, that the present might make a slightly more sense. Um, and I was also really um, interested by the way in which what I thought were some of the more radical aspects of the 80s, which is, um, which I see to be threefold. Uh, a profound um, rise, that's like basically it's a second wave of um, movement for social justice for queer people. Um, the art world, uh, is stormed by people of color. And feminism is rocked to its core uh, by both continental and queer theory and is asked to imagine, is, there, is it possible to have something called feminism in which the central category is not the idea of a woman? Like, is feminism a way of thinking ethically that doesn't necessarily strive for gender parity in a patriarchal system that is basically based on non-gender parity, but actually imagines a system in which woman is not the central term. Um, and so that's, you know, those are three huge, those are big ideas, big things happen. Um, and I thought it was really curious that a lot of those advances seem to have been um, lost in the art world. And so that's, that, that's, those are the intellectual reasons why the 80s show has come about. When will, when will it happen? February 2012 in Chicago, because the, that's the time to go to Chicago. It's February. <laughs> Don't want to miss that flight into Chi-Town from Hotlanta. We have time for one last question. Um, you know, sir. Sort of
there's a vent and I can't quite hear you. Um, just looking back at the slides, you showed a lot of work with sort of this with the conceptual presence. Mm -hmm. How do you want that visually or think about it since you're not writing the essay for the installation and sort of putting it together? Mm. Well, I mean, the great thing about a lot of concept, like in work ethic, the great thing about a lot of conceptual art is it comes with its own wall label. Because they're, you know, I mean, one of the dumbest things I've ever done is write wall labels for, like, you know, video Okanji pieces that have big text panels in them that tell you what's happening. Um, but I always try and, even in the, even in the, um, in work ethic, which is very conceptual and in some ways quote unquote dry visually. Um, I always tried to do these things that were physically rhyming, so there would be like a photograph of David Hammond selling snowballs, and that great photograph of Francis Elise um, on the plaza in Mexico City with all the guys who sell their sell themselves as like a plumber or electrician and he sells himself like he'll go and do your tourist labor for you, so like you can stay in the hotel room. Which is really like such a great, so funny. And so like things like that, just those moments of little harmony, both visually, they're both sort of standing in this very like cool, lackadaisical way in an urban setting, shopping their wares. Um, but to try to make those visual rhymes so that you don't actually, as the curator or the museum, have to um, narrate every move that you're making for the viewer. Um, on the other hand, I don't know, I, with part object it was so visual. Like the, it was really, it really was a, a compare and contrast game of the same idea performed by 12 different artists. And um, so it was very, I think it was very available visually, and it was very constructed to be available visually. Uh, I also try really hard to trust the audience. Like, they're there. It's the greatest thing about actually working in a museum here. Audience is voluntary. They've come, and so I figure they, they want to look. You know, just trying to slow them down. That's actually the biggest thing, I, that's the biggest challenge, is how to slow them down so that they do look. So they don't feel so like, oh my god, I'm here at the museum, I've got to buy a postcard, I've got to eat, I've got to go to the bathroom, I've got to do a coat check, I've got to... Yeah, it's just like, no, what you have to do is look. Like, how do you do that? That's more the trick, in a way, to me, than how to get them to think what you want them to think. It's more like how to just create the conditions for them conditions for people where they can have an encounter based on looking. Is that good? Thank you very much for coming out and such a lovely